Greetings and salutations, friends, and welcome back to the Horus Heresy Lore Breakdown. We are now on book number 21, Fear to Tread by James Swallow, the first book to feature my beloved Blood Angels. They are by far my favorite chapter, and uh, at this point in 40k or 30k lore, Legion, and it is entirely because of their artfully conflicting nature. For the Blood Angels are the pinnacle of excellence. They are the very image of what it is to be a space marine, to be the God Emperor's avenging angels, descending on wings of fire and clad in expertly crafted artistic plate, decorated with gold and rubies, none are more perfect than them. And yet simultaneously, none are more flawed than them either. The Blood Angels are beautiful monsters, always just one step away from blood-crazed frothing madness. If you had to sum up 40k in just one faction, the Blood Angels would be it. And for that, I love the little bastards. And yet... I'm not actually looking that forward to this particular book because of the author, James Swallow. Now the thing here is, James does not write bad fluff. He really doesn't. In fact, I think he writes some of the better fluff that is coming out of Black Library. He has a real love and respect for the source material, which I highly value, especially in this day and age where that is getting harder and harder to come by, it's just that his writing style, his prose is really strange. It's confusing. I remember vividly, whilst I was reading the hard copy version of this book that I owned the first time around, I had to leaf back several times and reread previous pages just to reassure myself that I hadn't just missed a piece of the book. <laughs> it feels as if you're reading one thing and then suddenly you're reading something completely different and you're sitting there like, wait, hold on. Wasn't I reading something else a second ago? Why are we on this now? And can it stop? Because I was really into what we were already doing. Could I see the conclusion of that before we wander off onto this nonsense? And it's a real shame too, because I think if James could just nail down his progression a little bit more and introduce a bit more of a flow to his work, he would easily be one of the better, if not indeed amongst the top, Black Library authors. But enough about that, so let's get into the actual book itself, and it starts out really, really strong. Again, James makes some exquisite fluff, it's just, it's just a shame it's so painful to ingest sometimes. Like spicy food, you know you're having a real good time whilst reading it, but you dread the future when it must come out again. The first Legionis Astartes forces we are introduced to in the book is not the Blood Angels and their Primarch Sanguinius, but rather Horus Lupercal and his Lunar Wolves. They had not yet become the Sons of Horus. They are carrying out a campaign against a Xenos breed known as the Nephilim. This is a particularly insidious version of Xenos creatures who feed on adoration of all things. They literally draw sustenance and power from being worshipped, and they construct massive temples and devotive spires in which the faithful are gathered and they are sapped of their life energies. They literally devour the souls, I suppose we should say, of the mortal populace, and in this case, the mortal populace is that of the Imperium of Humanity, an affront, of course, that Horus and Sanguinius could not possibly stand for. And so they are carrying out a war of extermination against these most vile Xenos creatures. 
Horusanupa Cal originally had the idea to carry out a massive ground pounding campaign against the Xenos. To have his Lunar Wolves and the Blood Angels march shoulder to shoulder across the entire planet, overcoming every last strong point the Nephilim threw up in their way, crushing it relentlessly beneath the armoured boots of the two legions. He wished with this to import a sense of shock and awe in it. He wished to crush the Xenos' hope and, more importantly, the hopes of their followers. For the Xenos did not mind bind all of their worshippers. Some they convinced, some they cajoled, and some they forced to worship them. Through this, Horus hoped to cause a revolution against the Xenos, or at the very least to cause those who doubted in the Xenos' cause to refrain from resisting against the Imperium's will, and therefore be easier to reintegrate into the Empire after the final victory. However, Sanguinius objected to this. He thought it too callous, too costly. He also points out, by the way, something rather interesting about Horus. He points out that when Horus saw this, Horus wasn't unaware of the fact that this would cost the lives of hundreds if not thousands of legionnaires. He was not unaware of the fact that this was to be a very expensive strategy. He had simply seen that for the fact that it was, accepted it, and moved on because he believed this to be the best strategy available to him at the time. He fully considered the implications, it is just that he judged the value worthy of the sacrifice. Which is kind of cool, it, it gives a little bit of a touch of humanity to Horus, even in his more extreme moments. And it's also one of the reasons why, you can see Horus during the Horus Heresy, he seems to be acting extraordinarily brutally. And that is not because he is fully corrupted as of yet, although I do maintain that his turn to chaos was way too fucking quick, it is because he knows this is the easiest way to do it. The quickest way to end a war is also universally the most violent and brutal. This is because war is the ultimate sanction. It is the end point of diplomacy. It is what happens when all other options are exhausted. And therefore, it is also where the fighting parties are at their most vicious, their most determined, and their least agreeable. And so the only thing that can end it is horrors unimaginable. And even then, there's no guarantee. During the Second World War, the Germans thought they could break the back of the English by bombing them. The English thought the exact same thing. Indeed, in the mid-war period, there was an entire doctrine that grew forth stating that the will to fight of any nation could be shattered through a sufficiently brutal application of aerial bombardment. The logic, seemingly sound, was to enforce such hardship upon the civilian populace so that they would rather overthrow their own government than continue to endure it. And yet in reality, <laughs> what happened was the London Blitz did nothing more than strengthen the resolve of the British. The bombing of Germany did nothing more than strengthen the resolve of the Germans, making them fight on until the capture of Berlin itself. And the mass loss of troops, of territory, and civilian populace in the Soviet Union, once again, did nothing more than harden the resolve of that very self-same populace. It is only when we arrive at the level of devastation demonstrated by the dropping of two nuclear bombs on Japan that we arrive at the point of horror required to force a nation to surrender. So yeah, if a war is to be quick, it needs to be unimaginably brutal. But at the same time, a swift war is also the most humane one. So, I can definitely see Horus's argument for brutality. Anywho, we have wandered somewhat off the point here. Sanguinius does not object to Horus's plan on a basis of efficiency. It would certainly be an effective plan. He instead objects that there could be a better and cheaper way. 
Instead of carrying out a massive long-term campaign, they should instead take a chance, a gambit. The landings would be carried out by the Lunar Wolves. They would present themselves as the sole threat to the Nephilim, and they would carry out their campaign of Scorched Earth. They would make as much noise and as much bright lights and explosions as possible, drawing the attention of the Xenos. The monsters would then come forth from their burrows, seeing their enemy in low numbers. Surprisingly so. And they would then decide, well, we can challenge these intruders. We can defeat them in single battle. We can shatter them in one single decisive conflict and secure ourselves for the next hundred years. Unaware, of course of the Blood Angels in orbit, since the Lunar Wolves had already taken care of the Nephilim's fleet. And so, when the Xeno's army had amassed itself to shatter the Lunar Wolves, they found themselves fighting not one, but two legions. This achieved Horus's objective of shock and awe. The Xenos were crushed in one singular, massive conflict. The undisputable might of the Imperium had been made absolutely obvious to everyone on the planet, no matter how deep they may already have gotten in the Nephilim's cult of worship. It also had the advantage of allowing the Sphinx Marines to fight the kind of fight that they were designed for, not a slow, grinding, exhausting conflict, but a single titanic battle, where everything was put on the line and the one with the strongest sword was the victor. And in the entire galaxy so far, not a single blade had proven more durable than the Legione Sestatis. And after the victory, we get a brief scene showing Horus and Sanguinius joking around with one another, reveling in their victory, exchanging playful banter and insults. It's wonderful. Two Primarchs is getting along. Isn't that just amazing? I just finished reading the Petarabo book, and seeing as that one is basically 99.9% .9 of the Lord of Iron sulking to himself, this is, this is nice to see, frankly. And it also builds an excellent view into the rapport between the two Primarchs, and it lays the foundation for their story from here on in. It's very valuable, too, because Sanguinius wounding Horus, or chipping away at his armour, allowing the Emperor to win the final confrontation, is an oft-overlooked piece of 40k lore. It is simply a thing that's there, you know? Ah, well, Sanguinius teleported up first, and he managed to do a thing, and then the Emperor was like, ha ha ha, I see the thing, Stab. But there's so much more to it than that. You know, that is a fateful reunion between two who loved each other like brothers, who were the closest of friends until the galaxy tore them apart. And it's also really cool to see how their relationship changes as well, how Horus is actually starting to turn against Sanguinius because of his own corruption, because of his own ambition, and because of his own desire for power. It is a subtle part of his corruption, and it's, it's what I've been requesting, honestly. Again, I've talked about this before, so I'll keep it brief, but the Primarchs, when they turn evil, quote-unquote, they change far too quickly and blatantly. It's like somebody just flips a switch and that are homicidal maniacs with brutalization fetishes, you know? It would be much more interesting to see Horus change a little bit more slowly. For example, realizing that he... Because at first he'd admire Sanguinius. He even says that Sanguinius should have been War Master in his stead because Sanguinius was the most perfect amongst them. And this is the Horus that actually knows about Sanguinius' fault as well. And then begin undermining that by Horus realizing his own position, how precarious it is, how much competition there is, and how his brothers now, they don't just obey him. When he gives an order, Fulgrim ignores it. When he gives an order to Angron, Angron was hardly the most pliant instrument to begin with, and he would begin to feel his possession threatened. And this would of course then slowly change his point of view. He no longer admires Sanguinius as 
the perfect brother that should have been the leader instead of him. Instead, he'd use him as that brother who could be the leader instead of him. That brother who could be competition to his power and his position. That would be a far more subtle change to Horus' character, instead of just building a giant monument to himself on the dead bodies of his brother's soldiers. Ah. Anywho, moving on. This lovey-dovey relationship also reveals the rapport that the two have with one another. Horus is a proud Primarch, absolutely, and yet here one of his plans have been questioned, and indeed even overruled by another Primarch, or overruled is probably the incorrect term. Sanguinius put forth an alternative and then managed to talk Horus into it. That is quite the feat. Again, Horus is quite proud, and for anyone else, even one of his brothers, to go, mm, okay, yeah, but what about we do this instead? That can't have been easy. And the fact that Sanguinius managed to do this, to talk Horus out of his own plan and into accepting Sanguinius's, and still remain on such good terms, is really quite noteworthy. It shows the diplomat that Sanguinius is, and the rapport that he has with his brothers, and here Horus in particular. But the touching scene is cut short when one of Sanguinius' closest officers arrive, bearing the brand new title of Chapter Master, by the way, and informs Sanguinius that one of his sons has been lost. This uh, rather peculiar choice of terminology, of course, piques Horus's interest as well, but Sanguinius either doesn't notice, or perhaps he simply doesn't even think about it in the panic of the moment, and rushes off to see to this lost brother. It turns out that one of the Blood Angels has succumbed to what we today know as the Red Thirst. He is found in one of the Xenos creatures' chapel, mechanically scooping blood into his mouth. See, that's another thing about the Blood Angels. The whole Blood Angels thing, it's not just because it sounds cool, they are, uh, well, <laughs> space vampires, basically. What makes them so goddamn awesome? They are beautiful space vampires. Beautiful monsters and all of that again. However, Sanguinius obviously knows of this, and he makes it clear that this is something that he has seen before, and it's something that he is starting to see more and more of. And it very clearly pains Sanguinius a great deal. He tries to reason with the Battle Brother, despite of course knowing that it's not going to do anything, and eventually the Blood Angel leaps at his Primarch in an attempt to kill him, presumably again to drink his blood. Sanguinius is forced to kill him, even though again he is extremely reluctant about it. He catches the Blood Angel by the throat and holds him at an arm's length, even whilst he batters away at Sanguinius' armor, only finally with a sense of resignation snapping his neck just in time to hear Horus enter the room. The Primarch of the Lunar Wolves had, unsurprisingly, gotten a little bit suspicious when a high-ranking Blood Angels officer runs up to Sanguinius and says that one of his sons has been lost. What does that mean? Is he dead? Okay, well, I mean, casualties are unavoidable, so that's hardly something to make a big deal about. Has he, has he actually been lost? Is he lost? Has he wandered off somewhere again? This would be a matter for, surely, someone of a slightly lower rating than the Primarch, right? And so Horus, of course, figured that uh, this was a little bit too interesting to ignore. He was probably even planning to just do so secretively, but the sight of another Primarch, Sanguinius of all of them, Killing one of their own sons, again, bearing in mind that this was way before the heresy, etc., that was clearly a shock to him. Although it is after the events of the purging of the other two Primarchs, which is interesting as well. Anywho, Horus wants an explanation, but 
It's also worth pointing out that he doesn't demand one. He simply just asks for one, and even says that if Sanguinius wants him to, he'll turn around and leave right now and never say anything about this, because he knows Sanguinius, and he knows he would never do something like this unless there was a damn good reason for it. It's almost touching. Yeah, again, especially considering what Horus will turn into. It's nice to have a little bit more of a, a look at Horus when he was a bit more... naive? Now, naive isn't the correct term. Trusting, perhaps. Innocent, maybe, even. But Sanguinius is willing to offer an explanation. Probably because he wants to as well. This is a heavy burden for him to bear, and not that many within his legion know of it. And it must undoubtedly come as a relief to be able to tell Horus, one of his closest friends and allies. And so he simply tells him everything about this strange curse that appears to be afflicting his legion. How it happened very rarely over the course of hundreds of years, but how it was becoming more and more frequent as of late, to the point that Primarch Sanguinius had been able to see a definitive pattern in it, and even establish organizations within the Legion, secretively so, mind you, to try and investigate it, to research it, and hopefully find a cure for whatever is afflicting his Legion. Sanguinius is also convinced that this is his fault, that there is something within him that it is doing this. It's not an external influence, it's not some Xenos threat, it's nothing like that, it is something in Sanguinius's own blood. Horus also asks some rather pointed and interesting questions too, like why Sanguinius didn't bring this up earlier, why he didn't ask for help, and why he hasn't told the Emperor. The answers to most of these are of course obvious, he couldn't ask anybody else because it would diminish him and his legion in the views of others, and Sanguinius didn't want that for his sons, he didn't want the apparent at this point failure of a few, because at this point again it, there are very few blood angels that have actually succumbed to this, and Sanguinius is far from convinced as of yet that this is a universal thing, because of course he can't know. He's certain that it stems from him, but he doesn't know what triggers it, to what degree, or what kind of latent possibility that there is in this to, well, drive all of the blood angels crazy. He doesn't even know how often it has happened. He seems to theorize already that it has something to do with extreme trauma, since the blood angel in question here had apparently been hit by a weapon that should have boiled his brain instantly, and yet the space vampire said fuck you and uh, just kept slaughtering bitches, which, I mean, good weapon if nothing else I do suppose, and his uh, descendants in the modern day blood angels will agree with me on that one. And as for the Emperor, Sanguinius doesn't want to tell him because whilst he agrees that if anyone could help it probably would be Big E, but two legions and their Primarchs have already been cleansed to a greater or lesser degree depending upon the theories you subscribe to, and Sanguinius does not want to be made into a third empty plinth. I can understand that one. I mean, I don't know if this is the f I mean, I think maybe Sanguinius is being overly careful here because this isn't enough of a flaw to purge an entire legion. I mean, the Thousand Sons were being turned into degenerate howling potato monsters for a couple for a while um, until Magnus showed up and made that pact with Satan and the Emperor didn't purge them. So clearly the, the bar for full on purging of a legion is, is pretty high, is pretty high. I mean, hell, the Lord God is still wandering around going like, the God Emperor is the light, ding, the God Emperor is life, ding, the God Emperor is everything, ding, and here's a lunacy on the fringes, so, again, clearly the bar is fairly high, but I can understand his hesitation. I mean, if a possibility of you saying something is the death not only of yourself, but of everyone you know and love, yeah, that, that is going to make you a little bit um, withholding, isn't it? Horus, however, is um, love and generosity made manifest. He understands perfectly and he vows to never speak of this ever again to anyone that does not already know about it. It's downright touching, really.
<laughs> I'm not even kidding. See, this is what I mean. The opening part of this book is genuinely excellent. It's got the action, it's got the combat, it's got the crazy, strange as horrible Xenos. It's got a little touch of horror. It's got the, the sorrow of Sanguinius. It's got the friendship between the two Primarchs. It is good, good shit. Unfortunately, however, Horus has to wander off to Ulanor to help the Emperor but fuck uh, Orc Empire into the ground, whereas Sanguinius has his own stuff to deal with. And the next brother he will be cooperating with is, um, less touching, unfortunately. You see, the Alpha Legion is requesting assistance dealing with the aftermaths of Ulanor's. This is then shortly after the campaign against the uh, orcs there, obviously. Apparently, a group of orcs have already fled from Ulanor and set up their home in another part of the galaxy, and have already started raiding neighboring systems. This is unsurprising, I suppose, considering that Ulanor was like the one remaining proper threat to the Empire at that point in time. An empire at the height of its powers, you can imagine how powerful this orc empire was, and therefore, even if it was splintered quite comprehensively, and its warlord killed, etc., just like the Tyranids, even the splinters of this orc empire would probably have been rather significant. And so, the might of the Alpha Legion and the Blood Angels will be used to crush this splinter. Originally, Alpharius, that Omegon, called on Horus for help, but he was too busy, and so they got the Blood Angels instead. The Alpha Legion stated that this crusade would take years, but uh, Sanguinius was like, no, 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 let's get it over with in a year, and apparently, Alpharius and Omegon decided, like, okay, fine, okay, right. We'll try it your way, although not really as well. It's, it's a bit of an odd one. On the one hand, the Alpha Legion are the ones that go like, okay, this will take forever. And then Sanguinius is like, no, 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 it'll just take a year. And then the Alpha Legion just shrugs and goes into the sector alone, ordering the Blood Angels to essentially put up a perimeter around the sector. So... They're clearly not really communicating a plan here, and yet... Lo and behold, 13 months later, so a little bit over a year, the final battle is approaching, in the void, with the last major enemy fleet on the way straight towards the Blood Angels, being literally herded in that direction by the Alpha Legion. So whilst the Alpha Legion have been pretty much incommunicado during this period, disappearing into the sector and then doing their stuff, causing all kinds of horrible wars between the orcs, and again, see, this is the goodness, this is the greatness. When James is in the zone, he both writes understandably and awesomely. The Alpha Legion come across here as fucking just wraiths in the dark, as goddamn masters of stealth and nonsense. They call upon the Blood Angels, the Blood Angels show up, the Alpha Legion are like, okay, could you just, you know, guard this area? And Blood Angels go, okay, sure, um, we'll be here for you later, and yeah, we'll, we'll send back communiques. And the Alpha Legion just pff, disappears. Even when the Blood Angels go looking for them, they can't find anything. Thousands of ships just gone in this sector, and the only indication the Blood Angels have that the Alpha Legion is still in there is that orcs keep fleeing the sector in complete and utter disarray, basically just throwing themselves on the Blood Angels' guns because they're more scared of whatever's behind them. There's reports of massive orc warfare, of bloody planets exploding, albeit no sign of why, and so on. It is really cool. Now, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense, like, if this is an entire sector, how the hell did the Blood Angels surround the entire goddamn thing? And how on God's good earth are the Alpha Legion scaring the Orcs away from a fight? And so on, there's a lot of strange nonsense here, but that doesn't matter, because in the execution of it, it's so simplistic. Simplistic is often the best when it comes to the Alpha Legion. They go in, they disappear, they scare the living shit out of the orcs, and the orcs then flee out, and there's mention of internal fighting amongst the various orc tribes. Alright, cool, don't go into any more detail than that, because it is just enough detail to make me go, 
cool. In fact, awesome. And not enough detail for me to go, hold on, wait a minute. That's not how that would work out. <laughs> it's really quite beautiful. Of course, the Blood Angels aren't quite as uh, enthused by all of this. They're not used to being sidelined, and whilst, of course, this is undoubtedly effective, and they're killing a buttload of orcs with basically no real danger to the Blood Angels, since the orcs are fleeing piecemeal and uh, unorganized. The Space Marines can pretty much just gun them down in orbit, but it's not really the kind of warfare that the Blood Angels enjoy, you know? This kind of long-range destruction is not their cup of tea, really. And so they do get a little bit antsy, which is understandable, and the Alpha Legion, being the cunts that they are, do absolutely nothing to help out with this. They send occasional communiques going like, oh, what? Uh, you, you heard a planet exploded. Oh, <laughs> don't worry, don't worry. Que <laughs> And that's it. I totally understand how that would uh, rub the Blood Angels the wrong way, absolutely. I mean, the least the Alpha Legion could have done is, you know, inform the Blood Angels of what's happening. Hell, it might even have built some relationships between the two legions. The Alpha Legion do occasionally whinge about how they're not accepted by the other legions, but if this is how they treat them, <laughs> small fucking wonder. This would even be a brilliant opportunity for the Alpha Legion to get some real cred within the Imperium and foster a relationship between themselves and a very respected legion like the Blood Angels. Send back detailed debriefs on all of the cool shit you're doing. Like, yeah, yeah. So we found this Orc Warlord who is jealous of this other Orc Warlord's extensive collection of rare collectible snotlings or something. And so we stole them and put it in the first Orc Warlord's shower or something, and then we took compromising pictures of him snuggling the snotlings whilst having his daily clean, and then we emailed that to the first one, and then, boom, half the Orc Empire up in flames overnight. The Blood Angels may have a little bit more of a sense of honor and close-up combat, sure, but I think they could appreciate that. And whilst dealing with the last Orc capital vessel, the Blood Angels being in the midst of boarding it because, well... They're bored, and it is a very large ship. No guarantee they can reduce it to slag before its warp engines warm up and send it uh, howling off into the Immaterium, never to be seen again. This is, after all, an extermination mission, not one where they can allow the enemy to simply just wander off. We get one of those little odd uh, sudden jolts, so... Carnos is engaged in clearing the bridge of the Orc vessel, trying to knock out the control panels and thereby prevent the ship from entering the warp. Alright, all well and good. Then an Orc Psyker materializes on the bridge, and Carnos has, somewhat absentmindedly, forgot to reload his weapon, or more correctly, in the heat of the moment he had not been keeping count of how many rounds he has left, and so when he brings it up to shoot the Orc Psyker, clickety, clickety, clickety. Sad noises all around. Then Carnos raises his hands in a claw-like posture, and prepares to unleash psychic powers, or, well, prepares to. It may simply have just been a natural reaction to finding himself without his bolt gun and now faced against an enemy psyker. If you see, Carlos used to be a librarian before the Edict of Nikea arrived, and then, just as we're about to get an epic showdown between a space marine wrestling with his obligations to Nikea in the face of an imminent threat to his own life, the orc psyker just dies as more blood angels stream into the room. Um... Yeah, okay. <laughs> and, and then we go on to a completely different thing, because one of the Blood Angels is a warden, or a chaplain. Um, he is called a warden within the Blood Angels Legion because the wardens are the ones set up to basically keep an eye on the rest of the Legion, make sure that they are obeying the Edict of Nikea to its letter, therefore wardens. And we suddenly get a conversation between the ex-librarian and the warden talking about how they have um, reacted to the edict. I mean, this is great, and it's actually a really good conversation. It's just like, okay, Orc Psyker, deadly fight, political discussion. <laughs> oh, Rightio then. 
Anywho, I really sympathize with both characters here, and the conversation is written really well because both of the characters come across as sympathetic. Both of them come across as being in the right in different ways. For example, Carnos essentially presents his case, so they, they argue with one another, yell at one another, they shout at one another. They're not very friendly with one another in the slightest, but Carnos's point is basically this. He viewed his psychic powers as one of his weapons, as part of his pe pe being, and as just yeah, nothing more than a bolt pistol, a bolt gun, a chainsaw, a power weapon, etc. It was merely a tool in his arsenal. And it was a tool that had served him incredibly well. Whilst being a part of the Librarius, he had turned entire battles on his presence and actions, and he misses those times. Then he was special, now he is but one amongst many. He is still a space marine, he is still one of the God Emperor's angels, and that shall have to be enough, as his captain tells him, but... Nevertheless, you know, when you've had superpowers, it's kind of difficult to going back to just being a dude, isn't it? If we can call being a space marine just being a dude. But he also feels a little bit um, betrayed, might be one word. I don't know, um, unfairly attacked might be a better term here because he is hurt that he feels as if the Edict of Nikea is something against him personally, and against all of his librarian brethren as well. They didn't do anything wrong. They are being punished for the, you know, crazy actions of Magnus and a handful of psychers. And that is a very good point, of course. However, on the other hand, you have the Warden's point of view. Because, as correct as um, the librarian's point of view may be, as justifiably angry he is, the Warden has a job to do. He has been appointed by the Primarch and by the Emperor, in a way, to enforce the Edict of Nikea. And so while he doesn't want to suspect anyone, he doesn't want to prosecute anyone, he kind of has to. And so when he breaks onto the bridge of the orc vessel and sees a former librarian in a clawed combat pose, with his finger splayed as if ready to shoot out lightning, <laughs> he kind of has to ask some questions, doesn't he? And he does so in a very interesting way. He doesn't outright accuse him. In fact, he, he more... He tries to warn him, almost. He's, he's not being gentle about it. He needs he knows that he needs to put in a warning, essentially. He needs to make the library know that this is serious, and if he doesn't control himself, there is censor to be had, and at worst, you know, harsh punishment. So he can't pull his punches, but he also doesn't really like doing this. He doesn't like mistrusting a member of the Legion, and so he's put in a very delicate position, and he treads the line fairly carefully and quite obviously. He states, oh, I'm not accusing you, I'm not making an accusation, but if you do not conform, or non-conformity is punishable right now. The Edict of Nikea is what it is, regardless of your own feelings on the matter. And it really comes across quite well how he is towing the line. He's, he's keeping this a conversation whilst also making sure that it is a warning. Now the librarian of course is pissed off about all of this because he feels attacked, personally chastised for something that he views as nothing more than a part of himself, you know? It's like being censored or being talked to by the teacher for carrying around a school bag of books under the suspicion that you, they might have some drugs in them, etc., you know? It's a really cool conversation, it's just... It's just a shame that it comes so absolutely out of fucking nowhere. I uh, Anywho, it gets broken up by Raldoran, who also views this as, you know, it's best to keep this at the level of a conversation without getting any further into it. 
We then take another rather sudden transition over to Fabius Biles' laboratory all of a sudden. Uh, apparently, we are getting closer to the time of Istvan now. And so we now get a look into Fabius Bile, uh, getting a visit from Erebus. Bile, it appears, has... Uh, been taking some souvenirs for quite some time, long before his research was unofficially endorsed by the Primarch, he was secretly gathering casualties of various legions that the Emperor's children had been fighting alongside, along with, of course, the Emperor's children themselves. And one of these casualties is a blood angel that he recovered on murder. Erebus has come to claim this blood angel, who is still alive, kept in a artificial state of coma, essentially, prevented from healing too much and prevented from awakening, but also prevented, of course, from dying. Fabius does not know what Erebus wants with this half-living corpse, and he presses Erebus for answers, even going so far as to de facto threaten him. But Erebus simply states that if anything was to happen to him, well, he's arranged it so that um, Fabius's secret mm, undertakings will be unveiled to everyone. Now, of course, within the Empress Children, I will hardly raise an eyebrow, of course, but Fabius has been collecting souvenirs from the other legions as well. Legions that are supposedly on Horus's side. Word bearers and sons of Horus amongst them. Ankron and Lupercal probably wouldn't take too kindly to that, now would they? And, uh, Erebus makes it very clear that he would, of course, hate to have to tell them of this, but necessity demands and all that. And so Fabius pretty much just has to shut up and let Erebus wander off with this comatosed blood angel for a purpose as of yet undisclosed. And speaking of the word bearers, um, the blood angels are preparing to leave after their campaign alongside is probably the incorrect term, um, in loose cooperation with the Alpha Legion, a campaign that the Blood Angels would sooner forget, as it, as far as they were concerned, was little more than glorified picket duty. But just as they are about to depart, a word bearer's vessel warps into the system and hails the Blood Angels fleet. Aboard it is one of the word bearer's chaplains, an apostle by the name of Tannus Creed. He is bearing with him brand new orders for Sanguinius directly from Horus himself, delivered in a rather unusual fashion, as the word bearers actually bring with them an astropath that opens up a direct link between Horus and Sanguinius. But before we get into that, there is another little interesting tidbit we get as well. So, after the Edict of Nikea, a bunch of word bearer chaplains were sent out to the other legions and accepted within them to... Well, I, I would say police the new role of the Librarius, and honestly, that would probably be the best term, but... As the word bearers put it, they were there to help them reintegrate into the legions, which is certainly a far more diplomatic term, if nothing else. This is kind of interesting, isn't it? Lorgar volunteering this service. I'm surprised so many of the other legions actually accepted it. Again, Lorgar was viewed by many of the other legions of their primarchs as, um... eccentric at best, and... <laughs> Fucking crazy at worst. But Sanguinius did not request it, nor did he accept it even if it was offered, because the Blood Angels already had their Wardens, who then clearly performed a slightly different duty before the Edict of Nikea, but since their role was already that of controlling the Legion and its morale, well, this was merely just to one further duty amongst many. But as for the true mission, well, that is a rather interesting one. 
The astropaths that came along with the word bearers carry out some form of ritual, presumably. Sanguinius notes that the woman moves in a strange fashion, as if all of her movements are very precise, as if in a dance. So in all due likelihood, she is basically casting a spell, carrying out a ritual, and this creates a smoky image of Horus, who is connected into this ritual via another individual who is with him. Sanguinius is very impressed that this is possible because, well, it, it isn't. This is not how astropathic communication works in the slightest. This is a manifestation of Horus. In much the same way, presumably, as we saw Lorgar manifest a demonic creature on the bridge of the Ultramarine's capital ship a few books ago. Horus then comes to Sanguinius with a very special mission, and he explains why he ordered everybody to leave the room and only Sanguinius to be there for this special audience, because Horus claims to have found the solution to Sanguinius's problem with the Lost, those members of his legion that go cray cray with the lust for blood. He tells Sanguinius that in the Cygnus Cluster, the local imperial government has been subdued by a Xeno species they both know well, the Nephilim. And he also reveals, quote unquote, that Horus's operatives have discovered the Nephilim have the technology to alter the structure of the human brain. And he thinks this could be used to cure the blood angels of their uh, thirst. This is good bait. <laughs> this is very good bait because, well, Sanguinius has absolutely no reason to distrust Taurus at this. He is the only one of his brothers that he has trusted with his secret, and he has been desperately looking for a solution, a cure, ever since he first encountered the first case of this rage. And so obviously, when Horus, his most trusted brother, goes to him in secret and says, hey, I have the solution to all your problems, there is absolutely no reason whatsoever for Sanguinius to refuse. Even though he does find it a little bit suspicious, he is to gather his entire legion to ensure the compliance of a single system, that seems like a bit of a hammer to crush a nut, eh? But Horus assures Sanguinius that if he would just obey his orders in this one instance, then the Blood Angels would finally find a new freedom. <laughs> I really, uh, this conversation too is excellent because Horus isn't telling him to do anything strange. He's not relying on uh, Sanguinius just obeying him. He's playing on their bond. He's playing on their relationship. He's playing on Sanguinius's hopes. It's, it's really quite neat and really fucking dark when we realize what Horus's real plans are in a little bit. And on the subject of nefarious plans, um, it isn't just Horus who's engaged with that sort of nonsense. Markador the Sigilite has apparently dispatched a small unit of space wolves, of all things, with a writ giving them his own personal guarantee and orders to go to the court of Sanguinius and keep watch. Huh. That, that, that is a rather unique order, certainly, especially considering it is coming from the Space Wolves. Now, the God Emperor dispatching his Praetorians to watch over a Primarch, of course, is something we've seen an example of previously in the case of Lorgar, but this one does come somewhat out of nowhere, doesn't it? And again, Space Wolves. Interesting choice for babysitters. No doubt about it. <laughs> I love how they're written too. Again, Space Wolves are one of those things, kind of like the Alpha Legion. If the Alpha Legion are written correctly, they are one of the straight up coolest legions in the fluff. They are awesome. But if they are written incorrectly, they, they're just boring. They're, they're just tropey, basically. Uh, they, they become the joke, 
You know, they, they become the Kekakudori nonsense that fulfill plans that should never have happened in the first place because it is based upon so many ridiculous little pieces of absurdities that it's, it's not a plan, it's a plot point. The Space Wolves don't suffer from that, of course, because, well, the Space Wolf plans are fairly direct. Pick up axe, run screaming towards thing, hit it with axe. Fairly straightforward. However, their nature is something that is often difficult to capture completely. The Space Wolves at their best are basically space-faring barbarian Vikings. They have a very... Uh, very old Norse feel to them. They're they're very direct and straightforward. They behave in a way of of extreme bluster almost. They they don't give a shit about anything else. They are the space wolves. They are the god emperor's executioners, and they behave like it. They view themselves as outcasts because their role makes them outcasts, and so they trade upon their reputation as much as possible. In in kind of a... In a way, they're trying to copy Russ, who plays the role of the Barbarian King so very, very well. Although, the Space Wolves... It's clear that they play the role less, and they probably believe it far more. They're, uh... To be cruel, they're not quite as intelligent as Russ himself, and so instead of truly inhabiting the role, personifying it, they have been more raised to be this way. You know, they're, they're rough, they're straightforward, they can be... What, what would be the word? Um, abrasive, certainly. But there's also a certain sense of good-natured humor to it, you know? The Space Wolves books did this so well, it's just so, so, so incredibly well. And these Space Wolves come across the correct way. They show up on a Blood Angel's vessel, which is the closest to the rally point where the entire Legion is going to be gathered. They dump themselves out of the warp, practically on top of the Blood Angels' vessels in, in, in an insane maneuver. They immediately then launch a Thunderhawk, not waiting for any kind of, like, approval to land or anything, and they, they've just forced their way straight down the throat of this Blood Angels' vessel. The Space Wolves then march straight down the deployment lamp, uh, lamp ramp the moment it hits the ground and introduce themselves, being assholes in the, in the doing of it. There's a, there's a Blood Angels in full gold armor in front of them, and the Space Wolf still has the audacity to go like, So, where is your commander? This <laughs> beautiful. They, they even have a Psyche with them. Like, the, the Edict of Nikea apparently doesn't, it doesn't matter for the Space Wolves. The hypocrisy of that, by the way, I am well aware. It, it really is kind of nonsensical. The Space Wolves just ignore it outright by saying like, Oh, no, he's not a Psyker. <laughs> his, his power is pure. <laughs> uh, the, um, the Blood Angel even points out like, Hey, um... You know, you know that's not legal anymore, right? And again, they literally respond by going like, Oh no, don't, don't, don't worry about him. He's not a psyker. His power comes from Fenris. But don't worry, he forgives you the insult of calling him a psyker. <laughs> oh, that is... Yep, that, that's, that's, that's Space Wolves, all right. That is good Space Wolf shit right there. And as for the nature of their uh, unannounced visit to the Blood Angels Legion, well, um, it is quite Space Wolf in nature as well. After the betrayal, I guess we could call it the betrayal, quote-unquote, or the, the misstep, if you wish, of Magnus the Red, Malkador the Sigilite has apparently dispatched Space Wolves to all of the Legions with orders to put themselves within range of all of the Primarchs. So, if the rest of the, uh, you know, Legion of Astartes hadn't gotten so very independent-minded all of a sudden, after the, uh, misstep of Magnus, the idea then apparently was to place Space Wolves in amongst all of the Legions in, again, kind of the same way as the Custodes were placed alongside uh, Fulgrim. Hmm. That, that is interesting because it seems like, um, 
Well, a bit of an... I don't know, it feels... Improvised is, is perhaps the word I would use. A bit sudden, like, okay, I get why Malkidoy is doing this, you know. So, Magnus has gone cuckoo. Magnus did a big bad, and now they are worrying that somebody else might do an equally large bad. I mean, hell, the damage has already been done, but, well, with the warp, can you ever truly know if things can actually get worse before they actually do? <laughs> I guess that is the problem, isn't it? But even so, dispatching space wolves to all of the legions to stand guard like that... That does seem a little extreme. Again, remember how badly Lorgard reacted? Lorgard deserved it too. How badly he reacted to a group of custodies staying with his legion. This seems like a rather risky move on behalf of, uh, of Malkador. Like, he, he would risk pissing off, well, all the Primarchs, basically, by de facto accusing them of being as duplicitous as Magnus. Ah. And it's also the first thing we ever hear of this, and I also believe it might be the last time we hear of this act of censor, so it feels almost like um, just a plot point for this book to introduce the Space Wolves, since they will be rather important later on, but... I'd be wrong. I, I don't remember. I think this is the last time we hear about Space Wolves being, you know, inserted into legions to keep an eye on their Primarchs. And if that was really the big problem, the psychic powers, then surely during the Horus Heresy, when the allegiance of the Primarchs would be, well, even less known, this edict would have continued, right? Hmm. Uh... Anywho, I'll wrap up part one here. This is uh, probably going to be a three-parter, I think. Possibly even four. This is a fairly long book, and it is quite interesting as well, seeing as the the central plot point, of course, uh, being Horus turning on Sanguinius for reasons that are far more dark. And thank God as well, because I had been annoyed about how easily the... The Primarchs turned to chaos, and finally, this book kind of gives us a different reason for why they're turning evil. You know, a little bit more meat on the whole, like, oh, they're bad guys now, Bone, which is quite nice. Anywho, until part two, I have been Arch. Thank you all very much for watching, and I hope to see you all again soon. Till then, have a good day.